Well, let's open our Bibles to uh, the Gospel by Mark. And as you open there, uh, this week is Passion Week. We're going to talk about that. This Palm Sunday marks the beginning of the countdown to the cross. Thursday night, we're having our Passover Seder. Uh, as you saw in the announcements, the, the beginning time for you to come is 6 o'clock onward. Uh, but when you come, you get in a line, those of you that are coming, and, and the elders are, and wives are going to be doing a, a special kind of uh, Last Supper washing, like do you remember what was going on in John 13? We're going to not do the feet, just the hands. So don't worry, we're not having foot washing, just hand washing. But it is preparatory, so don't rush through that. And I would encourage you, don't come at the last minute. The meal starts at 6.30, and if you come at 6.30, you'll be late because there is this little time of a quiet hand washing and preparation of heart for going into the candlelit meal. So come, you know, quarter after... 20 after at the latest, so you can get one of those lines and be in your seat by 6.30. But Mark chapter 11 reminds us today is Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday has always marked the countdown to the cross and the empty tomb. But that is the marking of the greatest event in the history of the universe. Do you remember the whole universe groans because of the curse and the fall and sin being unleashed into the universe? Not just earth, not just humans, The entire universe, it says in Romans chapter 8, is groaning, longing for the redemption. The kickoff of the redemption was this week, the greatest week in the history of the universe. The culmination will be when the Lord uh, finally uh, ends all evil and and rights all wrongs. But that, that kickoff of the finale starts with this time of the cross and the empty tomb. But Palm Sunday also marks the start of Passion Week, the days of Christ's final earthly ministry. Now remember, there are 89 chapters in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. More than a third of those four books, 30 chapters is surrounding this week. In fact, if any of you don't have a plan for this week, uh, in these six days between now and next Sunday, you could... uh, just by reading a few chapters every day, cover this week in the Bible. It's from Matthew 21 to the end. It's from Mark 11 to the end of Mark. It's from Luke 19 to the end of Luke. And it's from John 12 to the end of of the Gospel by John. But those 30 chapters are all about this week. And they're all about Christ uh, coming. And, And by the way, Palm Sunday is one of the three great events that God tells us are his top events, because before Palm Sunday, there's only one other event in Christ's life that all four of the Gospels record. Now, you know, if it's in all four, it's huge. Uh, all the important events are in the Gospels, but, but only those that are repeated in all four do we know God wants us to especially look at, because he gives us four views of them. The first event that's in all four Gospels is not Christ's birth. That's only in two. The first event that's in all four Gospels is the feeding of the 5,000. The last event that's in all four Gospels is Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. The only other event that's in all four Gospels is right here, Palm Sunday. This is important to God. And this morning, I want to show you why. In the week before Palm Sunday, Jesus launches the final of his signs. Remember, not Mark, but John's Gospel is built around seven signs. It actually says that these signs are written that you might believe, and there are seven of them successively starting with the changing of water into wine, and then uh, Jesus healing the nobleman's son, and then the man at the pool of Bethesda that, that was paralyzed, and, and all the way through. But, but the seventh sign happens just before Palm Sunday. You all know about it. It's Lazarus being raised from the dead. And so that event of Lazarus was causing people everywhere to talk about what had happened to Lazarus. Uh, He had been dead and buried for, John 11 tells us, for four days. Now, don't ever overlook details in the Bible. To the Jewish people, most of them were not believers. There were the few believers, but most of them were just cultural Jews. They were not earnest seekers of God. And so many of them had these superstitions that weren't in the Bible. And one of the chief superstitions, old wives' tales, of the first century was that when a person died and their body was put into the grave, their their spirit hovered over the corpse for three days. 
And the, it, the spirit kind of hung around, checking how everybody was mourning and seeing if they really missed him and all that before they went into the afterlife. And those three days were a time that, that they acted in a special way of their mourning and everything. And then on the fourth day, the person was really dead. I mean, they were a goner. The spirit left. That was their superstition. So it says in John chapter 11, verse 39, that Jesus waited till the fourth day. Why? Because when he raised Lazarus from the dead, he wanted them to be sure that they all knew he was good and dead. And when Jesus raised him from the dead, it caused just this, this furor all around Jerusalem because Lazarus lived very close to Jerusalem. So that was the first event that kind of is leading us up to Mark 11. The second one, if you look, you're in Mark 11, back up to Mark 10, verse 46. That's the story of blind Bartimaeus. That's the second big event that led to Palm Sunday. Lazarus was in the week before, and, and Bartimaeus was the day before. And as Jesus is coming up the, one of the busiest roads of the ancient uh, Jerusalem world, it's the Jerusalem to Jericho corridor, heavily traveled as people would go up and down that road. There was a fixture that was always seen by the road. Verse 46 says, as they came out of Jericho, uh, there was a great multitude and blind Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. This man had been always sitting by that road. People just got used to him being there and he was quite a vocal fella. And, and when he would hear people coming, he'd, he'd ask for money because he was totally supported by their gifts. Well, he had, you know, he also listened to what people talked about. And as the years of people going up and down that road had passed by, he had heard stories of this man who could, could feed people, who could walk on water, and who healed the lame, and who healed the lepers. And then he had heard that he was known also as the one who had healed the blind. And so Bartimaeus started screaming, and, and look at verse 48 of chapter 10. Uh, the people warned him and said, stop crodzoing. I mean, he was screaming at the top of his voice, yelling for Jesus to have mercy on him. And of course, you know the story. Jesus heard his voice, paused, uh, called for him. He gets up blindly walking uh, toward Christ. Jesus heals him on the spot. And, and look what verse 52 says. At the end, immediately he received his sight and look what happens. He followed Jesus on the road. So, so here is the normal crowd that followed Jesus. All the people have been fed and healed and everything. And then there was this new bigger crowd that had heard about Lazarus. And now we've got this cheerleader. I, I mean, can you, do you think he got quiet all of a sudden? I mean, this guy was a, was a loud, always used to calling out to people and asking for help. Now, I'm sure he's telling everybody, hey, that's the one that, you know, healed my eyes. So, so there's just this huge group and, and the people are coming. And that's why I say that everyone had heard about Christ's miraculous powers as Jesus was entering Jerusalem in Mark 11. And so that caused a real furor. And this marks not only the climax of Christ's you know, uh, crowd following, but also of the hatred of the leaders because Jesus was so popular. It seemed like the whole world was after him. Well, it's Sunday morning on verse one of chapter 11. It's Sunday morning, the ninth of the month of Nisan in the Jewish calendar of the year AD 30. Now, how do we know that? Well, you might look at your study Bibles and see that, that there is a countdown that takes place in the scriptures. Jesus, number one, it says in, in Exodus 12, Jesus was coming as the Passover lamb. And this is the, the beginning of Passover week. And this happened to be, this Sunday was the day in the whole Jewish nation that every religious observant family had to pick a lamb. Exodus 12 says, pick one lamb for every 10 people and keep it in your house. And so Jesus enters Jerusalem as the John 129 lamb of God on the very day that the lambs were being chosen. The way Jesus would come into Jerusalem had been predicted by Zechariah. Now the Old Testament, you know, it goes Zechariah, Malachi, uh, the, the second to the last book of the Old Testament, just before uh, Matthew. 
in that book, it said that the Messiah would come on the exact day God had chosen for him to come, riding on a donkey into Jerusalem. So here comes Jesus with all the Lazarus wanderers and all the Bartimaeus shouters and all the other people that had listened to him, and he, he comes into town walking, and all of a sudden when he gets two miles outside of town, he tells his disciples, I got to ride a donkey into town this morning. And they said, a donkey? Where are we going to find a donkey? With all these people here, we don't have a donkey. He said, don't worry about it. There'll be one there waiting. Why? Because Jesus had to come in, Zacharias said, riding on a donkey. And God's word had declared for hundreds of years that he would come on the lamb choosing day and on the day as he rode in on a donkey declaring that he was their promised Messiah. And he does. Well, Palm Sunday has some lessons for us before we read chapter 11, verses 1 through 11, and they are, number one, Jesus never forces himself on anyone. That day, he didn't force them to make him king. He just presented himself. You know what? Jesus wants us to choose to respond to him, to choose to follow him, to choose to be his servants. He doesn't force us. Number two, Jesus knew every detail of those whose lives surrounded him. As we read through verse two and six, you're gonna see that Jesus knew what the disciples were gonna need. He knew the donkey was there. He knew how for them to get the donkey. And Jesus wants us to know he's aware of every detail in our life. You know, you came this morning and you probably think nobody really around you knows what's going on in your life, how hard it's been or how good it's been or how nothing it's been. And, and you're sitting here in, in surrounded by people that have nothing, no idea of what's going on inside of you, you know what we forget? There's someone here that knows what's going on. They are intimately acquainted, omnisciently with every detail surrounding our life. And Jesus told the disciples one thing, just believe me enough to do what I tell you and everything will be fine. And that's the message of Palm Sunday for us. We have to be like the disciples. We have to respond to Christ. He won't force us to. And our response is faith. Saying, Lord, since you know all about my life, all I have to do is obey what you say and I will find you providing everything I need. The last lesson we're going to see is, and, and you heard the choir singing about it, Jesus made an interesting comment on Palm Sunday. You know what he said? He said, I'm glad all of you people are screaming and yelling Hosanna. Because if you weren't, he says, I deserve that praise. And if you don't give it to me, the rocks would. In fact, when we take people, we actually follow this road. And in June, we're going to be taking a group of people over to Israel. And we're going to come over the top of the Mount of Olives on the very same road. And as we're going down the road, I tell people, I say, if you see a little rock there, you ought to pick it up and get a rock that didn't cry out. They didn't have to because the people were praising God. But over the years, I've noticed there are hardly any rocks left because everyone tells them that and they've picked them all up. They're all gone by the road. But you know what the lesson is? God says, if you won't do what I want you to do, I'll find someone who will. See, he said, if you people won't praise me, the rocks will. You know, for us today, if you won't do what God has called you to do, he's going to find someone else to do it. Because his kingdom, his plan will be accomplished. And Palm Sunday is a little reminder. He doesn't force us. He knows everything we need. And if we won't do it, he'll find someone that will. And Palm Sunday should be a, a time when we say, you found someone that will, me. I want to bow, obey, and do what you want. Well, Palm Sunday is the beginning of the greatest week in history. Ever since God flung the myriads of solar furnaces into place and Satan rebelled against him. And as, as he promised that the Messiah would come, he came. And as all those countless voices are raised, Mark in chapter 11 gives us the account of Palm Sunday. And as we read these 11 verses, I hope that not only will you get a reminder of something you've heard all your life, Palm Sunday, but I hope the Jesus who doesn't force himself, the Jesus who knows every detail of our lives, and the Jesus that said, I deserve praise, and if you won't give it to me, I'll find someone that will. I hope that as we read these verses, all of us, in our hearts, begin that process of saying, God, I want to serve. I want you to provide. 
I will praise you. There's place in my life for you. Rome, or, uh, Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Let's stand together. You follow along. I'm going to read it, and then we'll pray. And here we go. Mark says this. Now, when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you've entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. Wow, that's quite a detail. Not just any donkey, a colt, and one that's never been ridden. Verse 3, and if anyone says to you, what are you why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it here. Verse 4, so they went by the way and found the colt tied by the door outside the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, what are you doing loosing that colt? Verse 6, and they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded. So they let them go. Verse 7, and they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. Verse 8, and many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches off the trees and spread them on the road. And those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Verse 11, and Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Palm Sunday, as recorded in the scriptures. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I pray that your spirit would speak to our hearts through your word and that we wouldn't just get more information but that we would become not mere hearers, but doers of what you want us to do today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, let's go through uh, this passage, just, just to pull out some of these lessons. The first lesson is this. God promised the day that Christ would come. If you look at, at verse 1 of chapter 11, to us it just looks like any day in the life of Christ but it wasn't any day. Jesus always was in tune with the scriptures. Do you remember Jesus said in Mark 4, I come to do the will of my Father in heaven. God's will is revealed in his word. So Jesus was, was orchestrating his life according to the word. And if we want to serve and follow him, we should also orchestrate our life, find our purpose, find our destiny, find what we're supposed to be doing here during our earthly lives through his word. That's what Jesus did. He always was obedient to the word of God. Well, what day was this in the life of Christ? Well, John 12 tells us it was six days before the Passover that Jesus went to Lazarus, Mary, and Martha's home. Remember, he had raised Lazarus a week before. He visits them in their home on the, the Sabbath Eve before Passover. So on Saturday, uh, he's, he's ending the day at their house. On Sunday morning, Jesus marches triumphantly toward Jerusalem. But how did he know what day he was supposed to do it? Well, Jesus read the scriptures. Now, for a moment, save your place here and go back with me to Daniel chapter 9. Uh, Daniel 9 contains probably the most remarkable chapter uh, and the ending of the chapter, starting in verse 24, of prophecy of any portion of the Bible. In fact, last week I was teaching for 30 some hours in Korea, and, and I showed them that the only place in the whole Bible that it says the tribulation is seven years long is right here. I mean, if you believe in the tribulation, it's only because God's word says that God has seven years left, and that's what we call the tribulation. But starting in verse 24, look what Jesus knew. Jesus knew that God had prophesied a day, a countdown to the cross, and that prophetic roadmap is in verse 24. And this is what the Lord said to Daniel. Seventy weeks. Actually, it doesn't say weeks. That's the English translation of the Hebrew word heptat. 
70 sevens. Uh, not weak, sevens. So they're heptads, they're groups of seven. So 70 groups of seven are determined for your people, for your holy city, to finish the transgression, to make the end of sin, uh, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. And then he starts going into this this. Um, description. He says, know therefore that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Well, when was that? Well, if you look in history, the king that Nehemiah was serving under, if you read Nehemiah 2, his name was Artaxerxes. He gives the command for Nehemiah to go back and rebuild, not the temple, but to rebuild the city. And the the first step was to put the wall around it. Remember Nehemiah in 52 days built the wall around it. He did that because a decree went forth. Look, Look what it says in verse 25. The decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until, so from from Nehemiah 2, 1 through 8, 445 BC, that's a historic event, until Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Seven heptads and 62 sevens. What is that? Well, the first thing we know is Nehemiah's ministry from that decree until the end of his cohort, Malachi. Remember, uh, Nehemiah was building and Malachi was prophesying, and so was Haggai. But from the beginning of Nehemiah's ministry to the end of Malachi's ministry is, isn't it interesting, 49 years. So that's seven sevens. If you look down at verse 25, it says, from the decree to restore and rebuild, there shall be um, seven weeks and 62 weeks. And it says the street will be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. So what it says is that a total of 483 years after that decree, that Messiah would be cut off. And the the beginning of that cutoff is right here on Palm Sunday. And what Jesus knew is that he had to come into Jerusalem on the day that all the lambs were being picked. He had to present himself to the people as the Lamb of God, which he did. And that he would be cut off. Notice what it says in in Daniel. He would be cut off, verse 26 says, but not for himself. You know what I have written in my Bible right there? Substitutionary atonement. That is the promise that Jesus would die, not for his sins. Remember, Pilate couldn't find anything wrong with him. No one could even agree that he ever did anything wrong. That's certainly not true about me and probably not true about you. Uh, You know, everybody can agree what I've done wrong. No one, even the people that hated Jesus, could find he did anything wrong. He died, look what it says in verse 26. He was cut off, not for himself. So let's not get into prophecy. Let's get back to uh, chapter 11 of Mark. So Jesus knew that after 483 years, in fact, they have calculated, if you calculate out the days, Palm Sunday was to the day 483 years after that decree was signed by Artaxerxes. And Jesus, on the 9th of Nisan of AD 30, marched into town presenting himself as the Lamb of God. So the first thing we see is it was the day that God promised. And many Bible teachers believe that God has 490-year plan for Jerusalem. It starts in Nehemiah's time. And 483 years ended of the 490 at the time of Christ coming into town, but you say, wait a minute, 490 minus 483 is what? There's seven years left over. That's the only time the Bible says the tribulation is seven years long. God has one week, one heptad, seven years left. Well, Jesus rides in, look at verse one, meek and mild, Sitting on a donkey, we're going to see picked up in verses 2 through 6, on the very day the Passover lamb was chosen by the people. Now, look at verse 2. The second lesson is the disciples had to discover Christ could provide all they needed. Now, here's Jesus coming to be killed, and he's teaching his disciples lessons. Now, what lessons were they learning? Well, the historian Josephus tells us that in the first century, in this time, when Christ came to Jerusalem, the temple record said that they had 
250,000 little lambs that had to be purchased, examined, and taken into homes. Now, we know from Exodus 12, one lamb represented 10 people. You couldn't have a Passover meal for more than 10 people for each lamb. And that was just God's regulation. One lamb for every 10 people. It's called a minion, you know. That, that then became how many you had to have to have a synagogue. A minion was 10. And so Jesus, on the, the year he was crucified, we know that 250,000 people came to Jerusalem because there were 200, or I mean, two and a half million came because there were 250,000 lambs. And one lamb represented 10 people. So, how many people did Jerusalem usually have? 100,000. How many came to town? 2.4 million more people. You know why I'm telling you that? Imagine Kalamazoo getting overrun with 10 times our population. That means you go to Speedway, and for every car that's there now, there'll be 10. I mean, everything becomes a mess. It becomes crowded, congested. Everything runs out. So look what's happening. There, with two and a half million people in town, they must have overflowed everything. They spilled out of the city. They lined every hillside with tents. Every city was overflowing and jammed. There was no room. And Jesus tells the disciples to walk into this little town and pick up a donkey. Do you know what they were thinking? He has no idea what he's talking about. There's not going to be any donkey here. Everything that can move has got people on it, and they're hauling their junk around and setting up camp. And Jesus said, no, disciples. You've got to understand that I omnisciently know every event surrounding your life. I know every detail. And if I want you to do something, I will supernaturally provide all you need. Wow. Though the crowd was streaming into Jerusalem, the disciples went against the flow. They entered the tiny village, and as they entered it, they found exactly what Christ said. They found not just a donkey, but they found the, the foal, the colt of a donkey, one that had never had anybody sit on it yet, and it was tied right by the gate. And when they asked, or when they didn't ask for it, and they took it, and someone questioned them, and they said it was for the Lord. They said, hey, you can have it. And the disciples found that God is never late in his provision. He is rarely early, but he is always on time with what we need. And the disciples needed to learn that because this was just the beginning of their ministries. But real quickly, look at verse 7. Because as Jesus went in on that donkey, few recognized who was riding that donkey. Um, I'll just read you a couple of verses. You don't have to turn there. But did you know in, in Genesis 49, Jesus was promised to come? It says in Genesis 49, while Jacob's blessing his sons, in verse 10, he says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Uh, Jacob had a son named Judah, one of Joseph's 12 brothers, and, and uh, 11 brothers. And, and the scepter, the rule, will not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. Shiloh is a Hebrew word for the one who will come. So Jesus was the one promised to come. And we all know that. That was a promise of Christ's coming. Do you know what the next verse says? It says in Genesis 49, 11, I'll read it to you. Binding his donkey to the vine, his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in blood. You know what it says in the promise of Shiloh coming? That something surrounding his coming would be involved with a donkey, that it was tied, that was the colt, the foal of a donkey, and that the one who rode it would have blood-stained garments. Even in Genesis, it was talking about this event that God was going to bring to pass. It got clearer by the time we get to Zechariah. That's Zechariah 9.9. 9. It says this, Rejoice, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of, of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just, having salvation. Now listen to this. He is lowly, riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. That was written 500 years before this day. God has every detail under control. 
And God said, if you want to know who the Messiah is, he's going to come in meek and lowly and humbly. He's going to be on a colt, the, the foal of a donkey, and he's going to come in not like any other king you ever saw. He's going to come in meek and lowly. God's word had said for centuries to anyone who would listen that your Shiloh, your promised Messiah king, your redeemer, is going to come like no other king came into town. He's going to come in quietly and humbly. The crowds might be shouting, but he's not. And you know, he did. And did you know the people missed it? They, they, they thought they were getting a liberator. They weren't looking for a redeemer. See, they missed who this donkey's real rider was. They didn't really ever follow Jesus. They didn't want a, a redeemer and a Lord. They wanted someone that would solve their problems. You know, that's one of the dangers. People want Jesus if he solves their problems. They don't want him if he just redeems them and liberates them from their sin and asks them to, in absolute subjection, bow to him. On Palm Sunday, the King of Kings comes quietly on a humble donkey as a sacrificial substitutionary lamb of God, and he comes into Jerusalem, and the people didn't even recognize what was happening. They were overtaken with excitement, enthusiasm, but they didn't realize that he was coming as the Lamb of God to take away their sins. But notice what they do. Look at verse 8. I think this is fascinating. Look at this picture of their robes and their hosannas and these, these tree branches. This is a scene that pictures a future coming of Christ. Do you remember when you read Revelation 7? The same thing happens in 7. They all have their robes and they're shouting hosannas and they're, they're waving palm branches, but that's in heaven. You see, the ones that saw him as redeemer are going to be in heaven seeing the real king. But the ones who only saw him for their own personal interests, four days later are going to say, the same mouths that said, Hosanna, are going to say, kill him. See, they're so shallow in their commitment because they didn't know who he was. It's amazing. We call this the triumphal entry. It sounds triumphal to us. But can you imagine what the Romans thought? I mean, the people must sing, this is the triumphal entry of the Messiah. And the Romans looking down over the walls, to them, this was no triumph. Did you know a triumph in Rome for a Roman general to have a triumphal entry? They used to do that in Rome. The general had to have killed 5,000 minimum enemies, and he had to ride on a gold, solid gold chariot, and they had to burn incense so that he entered the city in a cloud of smoke. That was a triumphal entry. This peasant on a baby donkey, sitting on dirty clothes, that's your triumphal entry? See, the Romans said, this is no king. But if you think about it, do you know what Acts chapter 4 says? Do you remember what happened after the cross? In Acts 2, we have 3,000 saved. And in Acts 4... We have 5,000 saved. So literally, this, this king that no one realized who he was, he doesn't conquer 5,000. He conquers 8,000. And the number has kept going ever since. You, see, you understand, they didn't understand who he was. Christ's triumph was a victory of love over hatred, of truth over error, of life over death. But Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, came so quietly that he was overlooked. And the people turned away from him. Well, there's one detail Mark leaves out. It's the depths of Christ's sorrow. And I want you to turn over to Luke because uh, I want to end with this. It's in what our choir was singing. Uh, it's about the, the rocks crying out. That whole passage is in Luke. Um, in verse 40, Jesus said, if, if you guys didn't praise me, Luke 19, 40, I tell you that the... If you kept silent, the rocks would cry out. But look at verse 41. This is what Mark doesn't put in. And, and remember, all four of the Gospels record this event, and one of the most beautiful ways to understand it is to blend together all four accounts. And if you do that, you find that at the crescendo of all the shouts, when Jesus gets to the top of the hill, comes down into the sight of Jerusalem, as soon as he sees Jerusalem in front of him, verse 41 happens. And this is what it says. 
And as he drew near to Jerusalem, is where he's drawing near to, he saw the city and he wept over it. Boy, that was a downer for all those hosannas. I mean, did you know that's how come I think he was able to enter the city on his own? Remember, it said that he, in Mark, it says he walked in and looked at the temple. How could he have done that with thousands of people screaming and yelling and throwing their clothes, their dirty clothes all over him? It's because he dampened the party right here with his tears. I mean, they're all shouting, and all of a sudden people are starting to nudge it. says, look at him. Look what he's doing. And there's Jesus, just tears running down his face, weeping. And then he doesn't stop with that. He starts this dirge. And he says in verse 42, and, and the way he says this, if you read it, he says, doom and destruction are coming to you. And, and he just rained on the parade. And they just kind of melted away, all the people, because they aren't there in the temple with him when he walks in, Mark says. And what happens is Jesus is sorrowing. He's in the depths of sorrow. Suddenly, over the excited chants of the throng, Christ stops. And as the city comes into view, a loud lament throbs from Christ as he weeps over the city. And what did he weep over? Well, I think it's the same thing he weeps over today. Jesus was weeping over the shallowness of their commitment. Jesus already knew that the same thousands that were screaming for him to save them would be screaming on Friday to kill him. You say, boy, I'm glad we're not like that. Well, you know what Jesus also saw? He saw a church called Ephesus that would be screaming that they loved the Lord and he would come to them sorrowfully and say, but you've left your first love. You don't really love me more than your job or your gadgets or your money or your schedule. You just love me in word, not in deed. You know, Jesus not only saw shallowness in them, he saw in his church. See, there's a message for us. Revelation 2 says there's shallowness that some of us that most loudly proclaim we love the Lord don't have a moment for him in our lives, our everyday lives. He's crowded out. Another thing Jesus wept over was the fact that they were so easily blinded by their spiritual devotion. Remember, these people thought that, that they were praising God with their hosannas, but, but they were blinded to who he was. What they should have done is fallen on their knees and faces in front of him and begged him to forgive them, but they didn't. They wanted him to save them from their troubles, the Romans, their taxes. You say, boy, I'm glad us Christians aren't like that. Laodicea, remember them? They were rich, increased in goods, and didn't realize that they were spiritually poor. They didn't really have the treasures in Christ that were offered. They were naked. They weren't wearing the, the, the righteous acts of the saints, and they were blind. They didn't see what God was doing. The church was blinded by materialism. It's not just the first century's Palm Sunday people. It's us to this day. We're still shallow and superficial. I mean, if we lived the words we just sang 24-7, Kalamazoo would have a revival. If all of us lived the passion of our hearts that we just were singing. See, we say a lot more than we do. And Jesus wept for that. We're blinded to his plan. But you know, the, the other message that I see here is, Jesus said, if, if you don't do something for me, the rocks will. You know what? Jesus is not going to be thwarted if you and I don't do his plan. He'll find someone else to do it. Did you know right now America has descended from being the mission powerhouse of the world? We were. We're not anymore. I'll tell you who is. It's that side of the world where I was. Those people have no thoughts except those churches are all talking about what part of the world they can go to. There are going to be missionaries. They're going to go to every corner of China. They're going to go to every part of India. We're worried about our 401Ks becoming 301Ks and 201Ks and 101Ks, and they don't even want a K. They want to give their lives for Christ. The Lord says, if you don't cry out for me, I'll find someone that will. 
That's the message, sobering message of Palm Sunday. Well, I think that the response that we should give to Christ is, he says, I won't force you to bow to me. You know what we should say? You don't have to, I'll bow. Jesus says, I, I want to provide every need in your life. I know what you need before you even ask. We should say, I trust you. You show me the path. And Jesus said, hey, if you don't do my will, I'm gonna get the rocks to do it and say, whoa, whoa, don't take the rocks, take me. I wanna do your will. And I'd like to join the Palm Sunday song that they were singing with a song. If you close your Bibles and grab your hymn books, this is, I found a song last night. I sprung it on Mark this morning and he changed the whole program that we could do this. Number 328. And this is usually thought of as a Christmas song, but you know what? It's a Palm Sunday song too. Because Jesus wants room in our lives today. So once you find 328, let's all stand. And what we're going to do is we're going to sing two stanzas of this. And then I want to explain something to you. Every Sunday at the end of the service, the elders all line up. Why do they all line up? For two reasons. One is if you have an immediate need to pray with someone, you can come right now at, at the end of the service after I pray and come up and talk to one of them. That's why they're here because they're shepherds. Did you know the, the word elder, uh, presbuteros, is also the word poimen, which is the word pastor. It's also the word episkopos, which is overseer. Every overseer is also an elder who is a pastor. A pastor shepherds. Elders are shepherds. They stand here to shepherd you, but it's not just, they only don't just shepherd in front of the church. If you see them in the life group or in the hallway, they're on call. They're kind of like a doctor with a pager. They are ready to shepherd. If you see them at Myers, they're still an elder, and you can still talk to them about the Lord. We want you to know who they are so that we can shepherd you. Now, next Sunday, they're not going to stand in front. Do you know why? Next Sunday, they're going to be in the fellowship center. And next Sunday, when I give the invitation, I hope you'll bring some of your friends and relatives and neighbors that you've just been dying to have them come to Christ because I'm going to preach the resurrection and the gospel and I'm going to give an invitation. And what I'm going to say is, if you would like to know Christ personally, there are a group of men and women. We've got this whole crew. Our evangelists have all volunteered and they're all going to be in the, the family or I mean the fellowship center out there and they're going to have packets and verses and they're going to be praying and if you take anybody to that doorway, they're going to meet you there and say, how can I help you? And they'll take your friend and share the gospel and lead them to the Lord if they're ready. So that's when the elders aren't here next week. They're there. But when they come this week, that's why they're here. Let's sing and make this song our response to the Lord and say, especially when we get, we're going to sing the first and then the fourth stanza, there's room in my heart for you. I want you to find in my life room. Let's sing this to him. Have you any room for Jesus? He who bore your load of sin as he knocks and has said me Sinner, will you let him in? Room for Jesus, King of glory. Hasten now, his word obey. Swing the heart's door widely open. Bid him enter while you may. Last stanza, room and time now give to Jesus. Soon will pass God's day of grace. Soon your heart left cold and silent, and your Savior's pleading cease. Room for Jesus, King of glory, hasten now his word obey. Swing the heart's door widely open, bid him enter while you may. 
We're going to bow for a word of prayer. The elders are going to be at the front. When I get done praying, Bonnie and I are in the visitor's reception this Sunday. Uh, if you're new, come visit us there. If you have a need, come and let the elders uh, minister to your hearts. Let's bow together in prayer. Father in heaven, I pray on this Palm Sunday that we won't miss the offer you have given us to bow before you and say you are the Lamb who died as substitute for my sin. And because of that, you know every detail of my life. And you want me to let you provide in our lives so that we know that you're God. When you provide for us, we see that you're real and that you do know intimately every detail of our life and it affirms and confirms our faith. But Lord, may we remember that if we don't humbly bow, submit, obey, and follow you, that you'll find someone who will. And we'll miss the opportunity of the greatest, the greatest thrill in life to be your slave, doing your will, accomplishing eternal good in our brief little temporal lives. I pray that you'd stir our hearts to be busy about what will last forever and that this Palm Sunday would be a beginning, a renewal of that kind of life with room for God in every moment throughout each day. So do your work. Uh, bring to yourself those who you may. May each believer here surrender more completely to you. And we'll pray uh, for great blessing as we come before you at your table tonight and celebrate this week of passion. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.